Okay, so good morning <laughs> and uh, welcome to this blended mobility. That will be again the uh, one that will discuss this innovative education in digital era. So this will have two parts. Okay, the part in the morning that will take us for three hours, and then the, uh, and ends on se session in the afternoon. Okay. So just remembering the the goals of our project, this is the Erasmus project. Okay. So our goal is to promote ed adult education. And so we are sharing with you our practices in terms of what we have been doing in the, in the field until now and uh, how we think that uh, are the best way or one of the best way for us to teach computing to young kids. Okay, so of course our goal is to cover the entire uh, the, the 12 mandatory school, okay, which in Portugal is 12 years, I think in Spain is the same. But um, but here we will be more focused on the computational stuff, okay, and how we should uh, uh, teach students to learn these computational uh, thinking uh, uh, practices and uh, how they can learn that together uh, with math and with their, uh, when they are learning mother tongue. Okay. Okay, so the first part will be led by Professor Zanono, that is with us in uh, in uh, Braga, in the University of Minho. Okay, so uh, Professor Zanono, I will now uh, put the presentation in your hands, okay, for this first part. And so I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, and, uh, and I will share mine. Okay, so I'm going to share mine. Okay, so thank you very much for being here today and uh, in particular for listening to my my presentation. Uh, for those who have already seen these slides, I'm sorry, this is going to be a bit of a repetition, but uh, there are always things that we say uh, that are different. Uh, not every lecture is the same. So uh, our our goal here I'm at, at Enciku, I'm, I, I presume everybody knows what uh, in the Enciku Association is, and we are uh, concerned with computing in schools. Uh, uh, and uh, it is consensual that computing should be introduced uh, in schools from very early age. Uh, but the, the approach is to computer education vary a lot. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to present into parts, one more general, the other more specific, is, uh, is this, I'll talk about the strategies that uh, we at NCCO privilege and use. And in particular, uh, our starting from what we called, or is actually called, with, we didn't invent this term, the unplugged method. I've been in the teaching system at university for a long time. I was just doing, it's for 45 years. It's 45 years of teaching. Uh, and uh, not every lecture is the same, and there are always the context when we we teach uh, uh, is always different, and in particular when we are teaching young, very very young uh, uh, kids, uh, it is quite challenging, and it's it needs to go, it, it has to have to have a different shape, because uh, uh, because they are they are just very young and. Uh, and uh, we cannot assume anything particular about their education. So, uh, the, our starting point, because this is a complex topic, is uh, some bit of archaeology. So, uh, look at how education was structured for a very long time since classical antiquity in the Western world. And uh, there are basically seven, seven courses. Uh, one more basic, the trivium, made of four courses, and the other, more specific, the quadrivium, made of four, uh, four courses. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric was one, the basis, and then arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Uh, and uh, we'll focus on trivium. Why? Because we think trivium has all the ingredients that we need for this teaching. So, uh, Everybody having these courses would study a language. Uh, 
and in particular its grammar and its syntax. It would also study how to reason, how to argue uh, using that language. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, that was based on something else, which is logic, aristotelic uh, logic and all that. And there was a third course, the third discipline, rhetoric, which had to do with communication. So it's not enough for one to know a particular language. We all know that. G knowing the grammar, going the syntax rules of a language is not enough. We need to know how to combine the words, the sentences, to articulate speech which is effective. And that's the art of communication. Uh, and somehow uh, this evolved uh, and uh, basically grammar led to the study of a mother language and also foreign languages, of course. Logic, together with uh, some bits of things of the of the quadrivium led to the study of mathematics. And in a sense, rhetoric is uh, lost, lost, lost its, its way. It became part of uh, the mother language course, but then it's not a specific topic. In the old times, it was because uh, for instance, uh, it was very important for, for people to, who wanted to be politicians, who wanted to be to follow a religious uh, path, to be able to express their thoughts in a convincing way. So this somehow lost the race, rhetoric lost the race, and around the 19th century, perhaps, uh, there was this big split between humanities and science. This was the big divide, uh, uh, and it's still prevalent in our days. At the age of 18, 17, 16, people start deciding about what the course of their lives will be. And basically, concerning education, they will either go to arts or they'll go to art science. And this is producing a very bad uh, result in our education. It's a disjunction uh, which is happening since the era of specialization, I believe it was for pragmatical reasons, for instance, uh, teaching Latin to a mechanical engineering is not very effective because, because machines don't, don't uh, speak like it, Latin, uh, maybe. Uh, and then this education started uh, losing, um, losing uh, steam. Uh, and that man that we know from the Greek time, Hellenism and Renaissance, the Leonardo da Vinci's, the Galileis, has disappeared. Uh, and now we have specialized bodies. We only know, we know very well, very well, uh, particular areas of knowledge, but we don't have a breadth. We don't have a wide uh, perspective on, um, on everything. Uh, some people say this is disastrous. We know for also for other reasons, but that this led to no reading. Uh, when you don't read, you don't practice uh, your understanding of a language, you start writing poorly, your speech articulation is uh, weak, and you are not convincing. We know when we, for instance, uh, have the students presenting uh, a paper or presenting a lab work, they, they feel very uneasy uh, in speaking. They, they, they don't like it, okay, because they are, uh, they are not used to it. And so they, they're not convincing. <laughs> they, uh, there is this uh, uh, psychologist who says something which I, I, I agree. There is nothing more powerful than someone who, who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power. And it really is, because if you are able to convince the other people that your ideas are right, you have power. Okay? And this is something we have to think about. But uh, things have changed. And there have been uh, amazing advances in uh, the digital world. And there, are, there is now a, a new body here, which is machines. They are not humans, but they, they are able to do things. And we need to interact with them. So uh, it's quite interesting. This is a bit of a game of words, but uh, it's quite interesting uh, that we need rhetoric here at this point, more than in the past. Why? Because we need it in two kinds. Human, human, of course, but also human machine. And I think everybody will agree that knowing a programming language is not enough for uh, somebody to write a program. One needs to write something convincing for the machine. 
we need, one needs to write the words that you can that are syntactically correct uh, in that programming language in a way that the machine reacts and does something useful for us. So in a sense, programming can be regarded as the new wave of rhetoric. It's a human machine rhetoric because that's the way we have to convince the machine to do something uh, useful. So uh, 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 I think this, uh, on the other hand, there is uh, one important thing that we'll, I'll try to make explicit uh, later on. Machines are very special things or bodies. They, they don't understand natural language, even if sometimes we think that they do, but they don't. They only understand um, mo particular models uh, which they, they, can, uh, they can accommodate in their internal machinery. And those models, as I will try to make precise, are mathematical in nature. They have a mathematical structure. So when we think about what to do uh, in this uh, frame of, um, uh, of events, we, we need something like this. We need, of course, uh, to have command of our language and of foreign languages, uh, we need to know mathematics because that's the way we have to convey our our uh, uh, our instructions to the machines, and we need computing. And it's quite interesting that computing can actually be a glue for these two things. Uh, uh, and this may seem odd because people normally don't don't uh, connect computing to the to, to, to the study of the mother language, but we have. In a sense, and and through my teaching experience, I, I I've um, because I I, I teach uh, programming, and uh, one of the difficult bits nowadays, more and more, is the students understanding the text, the requirements that uh, the requirements that uh, are written, uh, and they have to parse, and they have to understand and convert that to the mathematics that they 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 will uh, later on. Uh, embody in a, in, in a uh, programming script. So uh, we believe at NCGO that this is uh, something, uh, this triangle is quite important. So uh, we have been in this um, in this business for uh, two years, I guess, with the pandemic in the middle. Uh, and the, the aim of NCGO is uh, really to, um, to, to convince the, uh, I mean, those who, who command uh, our country, at least, and that uh, that computing should be a mandatory course subject in the in the syllabus of um, of, uh, of of the, so so it's a scientific syllabus, not just technology, and uh, equally standing together at the same level of maths, physics, and all the other courses, and not not something. Uh, not not something like com a complementary education. It is not. It should be core subject. Uh, well, uh, we started uh, in 2020 with uh, with uh, just three schools in Porto, and currently uh, it's a lot more. And we have a lot of experience, and we are gathering uh, uh, this experience and uh, and learning with it, and uh, trying to to improve uh, our approach. Uh, our our strategy has been to invest in young, highly motivated tutors, master teachers that we call them, uh, and uh, we uh, and go through an innovation first approach. So in instead of learning by the book, reading books, uh, we, we just decided to uh, start it our own path and uh, and uh, uh, and and see what happens. Okay, and uh, there is a lot of experimentation in what we have been doing. We don't yet have uh, the, the data enough for start writing, say, a paper about this, but uh, we are collecting it. So uh, there are some golden principles in the, um, the way we do this, uh, and I will uh, talk about them uh, now. First of all, the computer is not the aim. It is the means. So first of all, we have to avoid all styled academicism in uh, teaching uh, information technology. What is a computer? What it is made of? These things which are which are not exciting. It's just, and, and <laughs> moreover, all, the, all the, the students already know what, what these machines are. They have mobile phones in their, in their pockets, so it's not new for them. Uh, also, on, 
the, perhaps there is a better word for this, onwards teaching, meaning that what we teach should not be a foreign body uh, in the education. It has to connect to what thing people, or in this case kids, already know. So always start from something the students already know. Actually, I believe this is a general rule in education. Uh, instead of coming to the classroom and say, today you are going to understand something you, ne you have never seen before. I don't like that. I like, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Let us push that towards something new. And uh, that provides uh, a ground for the knowledge. So, so it's, it's grounded. Knowledge is grounded in layers that come one after the other. And also history and storytelling matter, in particular for uh, young, um, young students young students uh, so lots of uh, lots of uh, connections to store to, to, to history and one of them I will present here which is an example is not the only one it depends but what is just an example of how you, we introduce um, the students to to the digital world to the zero and one thing so the binary the binary system for representing information uh, there is this game uh, space invaders that everybody knows. Uh, it was created by uh, Tomohiro Nishikado in 78, and it's one of the most famous computer games. Even today, uh, it still exists and uh, people uh, play with it. And uh, a while ago, uh, Tomohiro published or let publish his notes, his, 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 his notepad, uh, how he designed the course, how he designed the, uh, the game. Uh, and uh, uh, and in this, you can see his way to producing the game, uh, because he has some ideas on this uh, left page, which are analogic, and he does a digital approximation of those analogic drawings uh, in terms of um, uh, little squares, either black or, or white. And that's how he did it, because those little squares can be understood by a computer. And the grid of those squares is understandable by the computer. Why? It is a matrix. And matrices are mathematical objects, and computers understand that. Actually, the memory model of the machine itself is a very, very, very big matrix or vector. Uh, so it it is ready to uh, for understanding these things. So uh, what do we tell our students? In our computer, which is actually a booklet, a notepad like the one he used, we are going to repeat his experience. So if he did it, we can also do it. And we use this um, this booklet that we probably know. I don't know if you if you bought if you brought some of, of them with you, uh, Louise and uh, Ines. But that's their first computer. It's just and uh, and uh, in the beginning they find it very strange that we call uh, a, a little notepad. Uh, in, in a classical one, so nothing very special, uh, a computer, but they eventually will, will understand that basically what's important in programming is building a plan. If you have a plan, and normally you build a plan writing or uh, t talking to people, so uh, building a plan is very important. And so that's what we invite them to do. So it's just repeating because it's just replicating uh, Tomohiro's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, experiments. And uh, it's very easy. They can paint these in their booklet because it's easy to paint black and white, uh, uh, black and white um, uh, squares. And then we start introducing how is this memorized? It doesn't know about black. It doesn't know about white. Doesn't know about anything. What it does knows about is the possibility of representing this by two little symbols, zero and one. But it can be uh, in very early stages. We don't talk about zero and one. It's just only graphical, and we are led to the digital uh, representation of information very early. Okay, very early, uh, and uh, of course this is this gives rise to Boolean logic and uh, Boolean circuits. All that comes along, and actually this is an avenue. Uh, uh, it opens a lot, a lot. This uh, starting point opens a lot of. Um, of, uh, of possibilities. Uh, then we start uh, drawing letters, approximating letters, which is scanning, drawing uh, uh, other pictures, so that they actually dogs, cats and all that, hearts and all that. And this uh, <clears throat> actually gives way to 
to more sophisticated uses of the binary system like QR codes and all that. So it's a wealth of interesting paths that comes along with this very early start. Bits and bytes, numbers and letters, Morse code, Braille, QR codes and all that. Uh, actually, uh, when we come to the representation of numbers and letters, it's a game that it's played because now we assume that they understand this duality between white and black or zero and one. And when approaching, instead of postulating that there is a binary code for every letter, we invite them to start representing a language which only two letters. And if the language has only two letters, very easy. One is going to be the zero, the other is going to be the one. But no, there are more than two letters. So what we do is uh, we do, do, do the same game again, and then I have another zero and another one on this side and another one on that side. So we get a, bin a balanced binary tree. We don't, of course, of course, speak in these terms to them. But what's important that they realize that every letter <coughs> has a path. It's very easy to find the path to every letter. And this is the way they start. Uh, uh, they are introduced implicitly. We don't actually, uh, we're not, not very specific about that, to ASCII coding and all that. UTF and all, all that thing. So, uh, but what's more important here is that this is a concept first approach. So at this stage, there is no computer at all. It's completely unplugged. And it's in their uh, notepad that they do all the work. So, uh, and this is true. Understand the concept is way more important than mastering technology. Actually, technologies fade away. The concepts remain. I uh, in these forty-five years of teaching, how many languages have I seen that have uh, had their fifteen minutes, seconds, or minutes of uh, fame and disappeared? And uh, we, it's actually uh, the world of programming language is a very strange one uh, because there have been thousands of programming languages. It is as if these computer scientists who who invent these languages, there are some somehow frustrated linguists okay because they want to invent languages so so they, they and uh, and uh, they do that sometimes with uh, a very good basis and those languages survive or with very weak basis and those languages just disappear so this is uh, an important golden principle of NSQL. the other is that uh, what we call modulation <laughs> uh, again i i stressed probably there are better words for this standard term terminology this is ours we can always adapt it to to the to the standard one but basically the idea is that knowledge <clears throat> knowledge crawls uh, from crawls in our our brain uh, from through three stages subliminal where <clears throat> we we are, we are starting knowing something without even realizing implicit well, there is already something we can um, we can see that uh, as the as as uh, as is knowledge, okay? And the explicit uh, uh, communication of knowledge is explicit. We just we, we have formally the defined concepts and the um, structures and all that. Uh, the subliminal one in, in this education which starts from grade one to twelve uh, is through tales, little stories. That's why storytelling is important. And uh, it's uh, our experience that it's that this is very effective. The, I mean, the, the characters that uh, that populate these tales become uh, become top stars in, in the in the classroom. Uh, in the game thing, uh, it's it's the same because we are playing a game, okay? So uh, and uh, and not the data structures, the algorithms that are behind those games are not yet explicit. And the explicit phase is a guided phase, okay? And the explicit phase can be unplugged, can be but but slowly plugging comes along, OK? Uh, so we call this the teaching style modulation uh, corresponding to the th three phases, unplugged, <clears throat> semi-plugged and plugged. The semi-plugged uh, uh, um, the semi -plugged step is in the middle, and I, I will give examples of that. There is something also very important, which is, we call it backwards teaching. What does this mean? Of course, so these this flow of uh, of of, uh, of um, uh, contents is not designed from early to late. It's is is in the opposite direction. It's a demand-driven thing. 
if I want in grade eight to teach this, what should I teach in grade seven, in grade six? Okay, so this is quite challenging. Sometimes we have to change things, but this is this is the way uh, to ensure that this uh, wave in subliminal, explicit, explicit uh, works for us. Um, another golden principle is computing should not spoil the child's brain. It should contribute to the development. It is uh, and also uh, studying computer is not entertainment. It's not robots in the classroom for them to. No, that's entertaining. That's entertainment. Uh, it should be a hard course. It should it should be something with its uh, theory. Well, in the future, not exactly at this stage, uh, and uh, uh, and um, and it's far more than using computers, and it's actually quite dangerous to in our opinion, to start uh, the plugged mode too early. Why? Uh, these uh, young uh, students, suppose they're in grade one, it will take 12 years to reach the university. It will take three more to do a BSc and perhaps five if they want to do an MSc. So it's 17 years before they reach uh, maturity and they can become professionals. What is the technology going to be in 17 years time? We don't know. So if we go too early for the programming languages and the programming style that we use uh, today, we are spoiling their brain. In particular, there is, uh, we know this trend, we know the trend towards parallel programming and all the strategies that people use uh, in the classroom are sequential. So you spoiling the brain of the child because you are telling him or her that uh, that uh, thinking sequentially is the way. It is not. Reality is parallel. And uh, I, I could even go even further into uh, something like the physics of information. Uh, and uh, we've seen quantum programming uh, popping up in the uh, even in newspapers and these uh, experiments by Google and, uh, Google and uh, IBM and all that. That's the future of those kids. It's not the miserable programming languages that you have today. So we have to be very careful about this because we can actually spoil their brain. And that it's my experience in teaching that when students learn to think sequentially, and, in, and, and it's very hard for them to think of another way of programming. They're lost. So that's why we are very careful about this. There are also misconceptions. I would say technology marvels the educator more than the student. This is this is a this is nonsense. It's, it's not. It's actually actually this. So the educators marvel and they, they want to have their classrooms with the tech very special very special uh, um, uh, boards and all that. Very no, they are marvelled with the technology. The kids just regard that as boring. Why? Because in their mobile phones, they actually have computer games which are far ahead in sophistication to the things that you can have in the classroom. So uh, so let us uh, let us point this misconception. The other is, and here I'm referring to some, something a little bit specific because in Portugal uh, there, there there is a movement uh, 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 to, to, to introduce computing in, in schools. And uh, in, the, I mean, in the programming principles, I was appalled to see that they, 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 they have written, this is tech, this is written in, in, the, in the recommendations for schools, that the students should uh, understand uh, uh, to, 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 to practice debugging, like the, the software, software engineers debug their programs. This is completely wrong. De debugging is not, as a software, as a programmer and a software engineer, I'm ashamed of debugging. De debugging only tells us that our technology is immature. So it's not a problem solving strategy. It rather means its absence. Please don't think in these terms that, that uh, if, if debugging was a, was a development technology for, for instance, civil engineering, all bridges could collapse because uh, because you have the you have the bridge you write you, you design it and then you start to see if it works okay and when you have to, to see if it works you have cars passing and if it if there is a bug in the bridge there are people who, who will go, are going to to die so um, so this is important debugging is is something which is needed because the technology is underdeveloped um, uh, when we get plugged. There are two different ways of approaching uh, uh, programming. Uh, 
And normally people use a code first approach. Even if in Scratch or, you know, it doesn't look like code, but it's a code uh, first approach. This is not natural because data precede the algorithms that manipulate them. Without the data, you cannot have the algorithm. Uh, and also in the flow of, under, of, of our flow of, of understanding, if you think of a baby, a baby looks at things. It, he doesn't have strategies or he's starting to have, but it looks at things, stares at things, measures them, he start recording those things, and the things come first, as I will try to explain in the second part. So data is first. So starting from the algorithmic side, in our opinion, does not produce good results. So uh, to summarize, we believe we are an out-of-the-box education project. Well, it started like that. It was our program to be that. Uh, we like learning by doing and not reading the books. Of course, eventually we will need to compare what our uh, results are with, uh, with a more standard uh, approach. We didn't invent this uh, unplugged thing. It has been on for a long time. I mean, I, I believe the term is due to, is to Tim Bell. Tim Bell is, in a sense, our inspirator. It's very important to fight the digital drug syndrome. We, I mean, talking about this will be another hour. Okay, this is very, very frightening. Uh, how how the brain of of uh, of young kids uh, are, is, I don't mean it's shrinking, but it's not is not evolving the way it should because of this uh, digital uh, drug thing. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, learning and teaching is fun, and that's the main lemma that we have to pass on both to the mother teachers, give them freedom to experiment, and both for the for the students. I uh, will stop now this first part, and if you have questions or remarks, uh, please uh, tell. Yes, uh, if you have any question, you may uh, raise your hand and we will allow you to speak, or you can also write your question in the chat and uh, we'll answer it. Okay, so maybe we move on. We move um, on and yeah. maybe the questions arise at the very end of these two yeah. parts. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the difference between part these two parts is that now I'm going to be more specific. Uh, just Not just general principles, but something which will boil down to particular strategies that we are, um, we are using. So uh, the first question is always where to start from. And that uh, onwards uh, teaching that uh, I mentioned is basically start from what children already know. I believe this is the same for other kinds of uh, educations, uh, education strategies outside the mainstream of education. Uh, uh, always start from some bit, some, some, something the student already knows. And in the case of very, very young uh, students in the first grade, for instance, we are aware that there are things around us and there are actions and events that can take place. And actions transform things. And this transform word was going to be important uh, in our principle. Action transforms things. For instance, if you blow, uh, uh, which is an action, a balloon, then it transforms. It, 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 gets, it gets round, OK? If you start paint, painting a drawing, the drawing is transformed into a new drawing, which now is, has colors in it. When children run in a playground, they are <laughs> transforming their physical position all the time. So if you have a GPS or, 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 or for instance, you now we know that uh, foot, football players have electronic devices that, uh, that are continuously recording their position in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the field. And so we are always transforming these coordinates. Uh, if we drop pebbles in a bag, it gets transformed because it gets heavier uh, uh, because it now has pebbles in, inside. So actions transform things. Uh, also, things can be observed. We actually we can actually measure them. For instance, we can say that a particular balloon is 20 centimeters wide. Uh, and uh, measuring and observing things is how we tell things apart. OK. Uh, and this is important because uh, uh, what basically a, a programming uh, a program is is uh, manipulating observations of reality. The program never handles reality. 
it handles an abstract, an abstract observations about reality. Uh, what uh, is information is what we, you, you obtain when uh, we observe and measure things. We, we build a mental model of reality. And uh, that mental model is not the reality. It's more abstract than the, the reality. And interestingly, uh, it's not the same. Two observers will have a different mental model of reality. Maybe there is some core observations that are the same, but we, some people, observe uh, some aspects of reality. Uh, they, they, they privilege some aspects of reality compared to others. And this is very important because it's the first time the word abstract comes in. And uh, actually, programming has to do a lot with this uh, uh, abstraction thing. Now, when we have mental models, uh, uh, we uh, may wish to exchange, to communicate them, and we can talk and write about them and about the things that we are observing and, uh, and about the actions we want to do. So we use words for that. We put words together to make sentences and texts, and this is the standard way of uh, committing, communicating our ideas or uh, about, about reality. Uh, when we talk about communication, uh, be it digital or not, and as I mentioned in the first part, uh, we need a, we we need a standard. We need a protocol uh, we, which oh no, which is known as the grammar, the grammar, the grammar rules of the language. Uh, sometimes the grammar can be very very elementary, sometimes very sophisticated, but this, there is always some grammar there. And so language is important. That's how we uh, communicate. Without it, we don't uh, communicate. This standard, this protocol, we, is an agreement between the parts that we are going to use this language. For instance, in this webinar, we've decided that English would be the language that we should be using. And when does thinking start? Thinking starts when uh, we start dealing with uh, our mental models instead of handling the, the real things themselves. For instance, we may start instead of, uh, of, of, of handling the object physically, we may start drawing you know, on a sheet of paper uh, our view of the object and, uh, uh, and that's thinking because uh, uh, the physical object is not present. And uh, this modeling of uh, reality is very, very old uh, and uh, it's been done for ages uh, in all fields of uh, human activity, in particular physics, engineering uh, and uh, biology, whatever. Uh, and what's important is that, and this is very, very important, irrelevant details are filtered by smart observation. So a good observer for uh, the fulfillment of a particular task uh, is able to uh, discard uh, the aspects of reality which don't belong to the solution. I mean, that's that's another side of reality. We want to cope with this part of reality. And this is important because, uh, for instance, in programming, sometimes the students are find it very hard to, uh, they, they have too much detail in their me mental models and sometimes with quite disastrous uh, consequences. I could give stories because I have many about this, uh, this uh, lack of, uh, um, of uh, uh, abstraction capabilities. Um, so well, when does abstract thinking start? It starts when we start expressing our mental models, which could be drawings or uh, even just ideas, using mathematical objects. Uh, because now we can calculate the solutions without experimenting them. And this is a big step. First of all, what is mathematics? Well, it's just another language. But it is a special language. It is formal. So the gram is not only grammar rules that uh, that exist in the language. Is there is a formal semantics, and because of that formal semantics, rigorous semantics, uh, it's a language we, where you can where you can do deduct deductive reasoning and calculational thinking. You can calculate things. For instance, you have a problem of desi designing something in a room, and instead of experimenting with uh, experiment with a physical object, we just draw, uh, uh, build our mental model, what are the dimensions, uh, and then we build equations and we solve the equations. And this mathematical modeling is a major step in human history. It's very, it's, it dates for very, very early early times, and this is the beginning of uh, science. OK, that's when you start. So it's when we start uh, thinking abstractly. 
what is computational thinking then? Well, is it is it uh, is it very different from this? No, it is an evolution of this. The only thing that happens is that uh, these abstract models that we could solve by hand are now solved by a computer. We use the computer to encode and solve the maths of our models. And it started a long time ago, slide rules and all that, and then the analog computers and then uh, digital computers. But basically what we do is we seek help. We have the, the abstract models. We could do the calculations ourselves, as in the 17th century, there were people who were employed to, to do calculations, but we have a faster and more reliable way of doing that, which is hiring a computer instead of hiring a, a personal computer. And the, the, this connection to, to this uh, math, maths, uh, maths um, background, which is not uh, well acknowledged. Sometimes people think that uh, computing has nothing or has little to do with mathematics. I'm afraid they are wrong. They, are, they don't want to admit something which is a real evidence because every time you write something and say, well, the maths of your program, it doesn't look like is this. We can always tell what it, what, what, what it is. And when a, a program goes wrong, it's always a mathematical law that is violated. What people are not aware is that this is what's happening. They don't. They are not aware that this is happening. But with a little, uh, well, of course, with training and study, they will uh, realize that. And actually, programming started it from this exactly. The first programming language that we can call that, well, it, it came along with others, but the one which had more impact was Fortran in the 50s. Uh, led, uh, designed by a, deal, by a team led by John Bacchus, a famous computer scientist. And why was John, why did John Bacchus design this language? He was solving differential equations directly in binary code. So it was a nightmare. And so what he decided is to design a language with, where you could write the mathematical formulas. The first three letters of the Fortran are formula and translate those formulas into binary codes. So uh, this is actually the cradle of software as we know it. And you see that from the very, very beginning, uh, programming languages are just ways of recording and uh, communicating mathematical expressions. Uh, of course, there was an amazing evolution. Uh, and now the, that incipient software thing that started in the 50s now is everywhere, is pervasive, and is unavoidable. So because digital hardware has become very, very powerful, data are processed very fast, and we are aware that software is everywhere in our lives, in our home banking, uh, when we use mobile phones to communicate, uh, when we use um, word processors to, to write uh, texts. So uh, uh, it's everywhere. Every, everywhere. Uh, but there is a problem. And uh, as, uh, as a, a university teacher, I, I'm very much aware of this problem, is that uh, uh, the problem is that people don't master the, this new trivia. They are, uh, they cannot express themselves properly in their own language. So if you cannot express yourself properly in your own language, uh, you are, in a weak position to convey what you think to a computer. And also there is this math phobia thing, which is moving th people out of mathematics. Perhaps it's not their fault. Perhaps it's the, it's, the fault is the way we teach mathematics, but that's another story. But uh, more and more, I would say, I see <laughs> that uh, there is a problem. And actually, if you look at um, uh, yeah, the literature on the software, uh, on the software technologies, there is something people call the software crisis. The software crisis uh, was identified in the 1960s, and everybody agrees that it is not over. So we still don't master software the way we should to be able to cope with um, the things that uh, we are trying to, to use computers for, which are more and more complex. So <clears throat> computational thinking does not mean that we should think like a computer. I'm a human, we all are, and I must say we are far better thinkers than computers. Computers are stupid, but they are very powerful. So if you teach them in the right way, they can do amazing things. 
if you them if we teach them wrongly they will do things which i mean uh, 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 surprise us okay uh, so what computational thinking is is shaping our thoughts our mental models into a format that the computer can understand and because computers can only understand mathematical models we have to be able to shape them in that way even i mean you've heard of chat gpt there is a lot of uh, fuss about this countries uh, forbidding its use uh, others welcoming it and we could say well if you look at chat gpt uh, mathematics is over because uh, you interact with the machine using your own, your own language so maths is over no it's not if you look at the the, the internals of chat gpt uh, it's amazing the amount of mathematics that's there it's even more mathematical than a standard program uh, it involves derivatives matrix linear algebra non-linear operators so it's very very complex and it's inherently mathematical so for those who think that these technologies uh, will uh, um, will uh, free people from needing to think abstractly they they are uh, they, they are not right and, and and it's actually if we look at the the new trivial I've done experiments with ChatGPT, not enough number of experiments to be completely sure about this, but I did the following. I wrote a set of requirements, actually a question that we use uh, in our in our teaching, particular question, and I wrote it in bad English, not, not, ex not exactly with wrong grammar, but badly, badly written, long, longer text with less structure, and the same text, with a very clear cut stru uh, stru uh, structure and and then asked the, the the machine to give me a program and uh, of course i was expecting this the program that it gave for, for when i wrote the good english was much better than the other one so we see and it's uh, it's actually also in this dimension evidence that we need to master our own language, or in this case English, but actually uh, ChatGPT understands other, langu other languages, as we know. Uh, so we, uh, uh, this is even more important now. But when we think about uh, educating very young people, people from uh, first grade, there is another challenge, which is we have to teach them how to build mathematical models without explicit use of maths because they don't, they don't know maths. It will take some time for them to know that maths. And this is a real challenge. Uh, off the record, uh, there is this math phobia thing, I think everywhere in the Western world. Uh, I must uh, say that, uh, so we, uh, uh, our, our knowledge about uh, uh, software design is weak, relatively weak. So it's a relatively underdeveloped body of knowledge. People may tell you the opposite, but it's not true, in my opinion, because it is pre-scientific. So it's pre-scientific. It's not truly scientific. It's not like in physics or uh, whatever. So uh, it's pre-scientific. It's just a, a, a set of recipes that people use uh, to, to write programs. And uh, teaching computer programming is a failed thing. Uh, when we see how many years we need to teach people to to program, uh, and I would say teaching programming is the, one of the most unsuccessful uh, ex experiences in, uh, in in teaching in the STEM field. So so so, so we have to admit this, uh, and uh, and uh, and so we are in a quite weak position uh, to start doing this now in this very challenging context of uh, uh, great, uh, very early grades. So we have to do things in a different way. So our strategy is then this subliminal implicit explicit chain, unplugged, semi-plugged. What is semi-plugged? Well, unplugged is easy. Everything is pen and pencil and paper, drawings, tales, games, and so on. Semi-plugged, the student is unplugged, still writing in the uh, uh, in their uh, on, on their on their uh, uh, notepads, but the teacher is plugged, and so what happens in this case is that not only they can do things in their uh, in their uh, in their notepad, and then the teacher confirms the outcome of what they have by 
running the program. Or there is an interesting uh, aspect side of this, which is, for instance, if you ask the students to add five numbers, their first answer is, I don't need a computer for that. I can do that myself. Ten numbers, well, they can still can do that. 100 numbers, they said, oh, that's boring. That's the immediately say that, well, that's so because it is a repetitive thing. And the thing uh, which happens with us humans is that we hate repetitive tasks. Actually, we start failing when the task is very repetitive. Uh, uh, and uh, that's the opposite of computers. Computers are very good at repetitive, repetitive tasks. So one of the effects of this semi-plugged teaching is uh, they have done, they have added five numbers and now the computer is going to add one million. And it is a, a scaling effect. So it is, they, they see that the computer is exactly for that. It's a scaling thing, scale up thing. So it does tasks that are not inherently more complex. They are just too big for our brain, okay? And the plugged mode is basically both teacher and student uh, plugged. And they go, of course, in this case, they are going to write they are going to write the program. So let us uh, let us just see. Uh, or, or there, there are many <coughs> experiments that we have done. Then one that I quite like is this. Uh, suppose we have uh, we have this um, uh, this uh, uh, chess board with these numbers up there, and this uh, uh, experiment can be done in several uh, modulations of sophistication. You, they can they can actually draw these. And then they put little pebbles of uh, of paper or whatever labeled with numbers and play the game. Or if there is this possibility, dancing this game. Uh, if there is a floor uh, uh, with this structure uh, uh, and actually dancing. And and uh, um, and then what is the what is the game? The game. Uh, I, I will. I have a video here, and I will show the video is a prototype of this uh, and then i will be uh, ex uh, explain what it means so let us see it So we see that the numbers were unordered and now they are ordered. And uh, as you move downwards, in this case, in the chessboard, it's time, it's time uh, elapsing. OK, so uh, what? Uh, uh, let me move on. OK, so what is this thing? It's a game. Basically, uh, uh, it's number or it's child or whatever, or this is pebble, decides to, to go to the next row uh, and and place uh, itself somewhere. It can be anywhere, but in the middle is better. And now there is this uh, red line, which uh, is going to uh, divide the, the the board in two parts. Uh, and the, the ones less than the that, 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 that pebble that moves uh, goes uh, blue, and it's the pivot in this game. And then all smaller to the pivot go to the left side and the other go to the right side. And this is repeated now for the right hand side of the board and for the left hand side of the board. So again, there are new pivots. Uh, and so the pebbles start or the children start becoming blue. And in the end, all of them are blue. And when they move to the to the same row, maybe it can actually be the last one, uh, they are ordered. So. Uh, the, the rules of the game can change. For instance, we might, uh, we might say that the, the pivot doesn't need to be the, the, the leftmost uh, element of the, of, the, of the board, can be anyone. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, um, uh, and what is this? What is this game which they play? They they find interest, or you, you you could you could they could take decisions on where to go depending on their height. Okay, so in the end, when they when this stops, they are ordered by their height. Uh, and what's this? This is a subliminal teaching. Why? Because what they are dancing or playing with is a very well known algorithm in um, in computing, which is the quicksort algorithm for sorting sequences. Uh, so 
subliminally in what sense? Children are not aware of what is happening. Uh, they, what happens is that they are, in this game, they are the data. And the rules of the game are the algorithm. Uh, it's, uh, the, this parallel can be done in other, in other contexts. For instance, when we are cooking, we have the ingredients that we have to buy to, to, to do, to do uh, and the recipe. The recipe is a set of rules or instructions. There are priorities. This should go, flour should go first and all that. So that's the algorithm. So they are not aware that if they, if, if they are dancing this, they, they are the data. And the rules of the game are the algorithm. The other thing which they don't know is that when, when they, all of them uh, become blue, they form, as you see in this slide, what is called a binary search tree. And this is uh, actually the heart or the essence of this algorithm. So it will, it will take very long before they actually go back to this uh, in, explicit, uh, in an explicit way. In an explicit way, they will know that this is actually a, a divide and conquer algorithm that uh, is one of the most popular and effective for uh, sorting. So, uh, but in the beginning, in, in these very early experiments, it's just a game like in any other. In the semi plugged mode, uh, we uh, uh, basically uh, do the same, but now we have to decide because now there is something new, which is a program that uh, the teacher is going to play with. And how do we start uh, telling the students that programs exist? Well, uh, if you look at this uh, dichotomy between things and ac actions, this dichotomy, as I said, is uh, inherent in programming. The things are the data, the actions are the algorithms. There is this famous book by Niklas Wirth, uh, uh, algorithms plus data structures equal programs. And this equation is actually uh, very true. These are the ingredients of a program, uh, although he admitted that the title would read better if uh, it uh, was written, if it were written data structures plus algorithms are programs. So giving priority to data. So again, I mentioned the golden principle that things, data come first. So uh, which things first? One of the things that uh, the people uh, understand very easily from a very e early age is positional information. And so this brings about the notion of a sequence, a sequence of things. Uh, it's very easy to identify in the queue if you are ahead, if you are behind, how many people in the queue swapping, reversing. Uh, these are very intuitive concepts and the uh, sequences are data. So we have decided to start from sequences. And it's interesting because this morning when I arrived here, I was looking at when, when did, this, did this start? I remember in 1985, we gave a course to Texas Instruments uh, people uh, in Porto about formal modeling. And we started exactly in the same way from sequences. So you see that uh, this, uh, this is kind of invariant of this way of, of teaching. So data first, and which data first? Sequences. So it's very easy, and then uh, quite a lot of terminology uh, pops up, like the head of the sequence, the first element of the sequence, the rest of the sequence, which is the tail. And then if you do the same, uh, if you do the same, but now in reverse order, you have the last element of the sequence and the initial part of the sequence. So there's a vocabulary that comes along with this data structure, which is very easy to understand. Uh, uh, and then how do we materialize or we formalize these sequences? First, by just telling what the things are. Locomotive, green wagon, red wagon. Then putting some commas because uh, maybe they are useful because there may be things that have commas in uh, So So putting some commas. Then perhaps signal the beginning of the sequence, sorry. Signaling the beginning of the sequence and the end of the sequence. And now we are ready. We have we have the formal notation for describing sequences. You can have uh, sequences of uh, like the like the drawing here. You have that cue written in as, as, a, as a sequence with the names of the people uh, like Mary and John, Ellen, Carr, and all that. So uh, the other thing is that uh, computing is highly metaphoric. 
is that there is perhaps no no body no other body of knowledge that is more metaphoric in the sense that every time we have something to model or some, some even some mathematical model we try to find something in reality which uh, uh, which uh, which uh, uh, corresponds to that um, so this is the reverse process an abstract concept that uh, that is named after a real life concept for instance stacks Stacks are sequences, but now the only thing that changes is that it goes in the vertical uh, axis or direction instead of the horizontal one. And it's easy to see which, what is the book at the top of the, of the stack. And when we start to, to take books out, we have to go in order, okay? And otherwise the pile, the pile uh, uh, is destroyed. Uh, we may ask, for instance, how many books are in this stack? In other words, and there we are playing with language. What is the size of this? If uh, that's uh, the proper word. Uh, but we can actually say the same with less words. The size of the stack. The definite articles are perhaps not needed. Size stack, and this is enough. Size stack is exactly the observation that we can immediately uh, tell, uh, ask the computer to do. Of course, we have to. We need to have defined it. We need to define the stack, but it's quite easy because we uh, actually declare the stack uh, as, as as you find here, which is the stack is a sequence of the green book, the blue book, the red book, the yellow book, the purple book, uh, and uh, this abstract model is modeling the picture uh, on the right hand side. And it's very easy uh, to grasp. And uh, this is the beginning of our plugging strategy, which has the following uh, principle. The notebook is what we normally use to think, to take notes, to reason, to record things. So we want the technology not to be a foreign body in this, completely changing the paradigm. So we went for a technology where you actually uh, use a notebook, an electronic notebook, and we decided to use Jupyter notebook, where you actually can write cells which are text. You can put images there, but as you see here, maybe I hope you you see you see the um, this uh, cell number three here. I have, and in this unplugged mode, it's the teacher that writes this. Stack is green, blue, red, yellow, purple. And now size stack, let us write size stack and you get five. So so you see that uh, that uh, the transition from the pure unplugged paper based pen, paper, pen and pen, paper based uh, uh, approach now scales up uh, naturally to something which is still a notebook, but is an electronic notebook. And uh, and uh, we find this uh, to be quite effective. Uh, now we ask, what about actions? Because we have told about uh, about uh, uh, the sequences, for instance, but uh, but uh, how is size programmed, for instance? Well, and this is quite important because it's now the time to tell that this sentence before actions transform things is the clue to start uh, teaching algorithmic knowledge. Uh, why? First of all, we don't uh, uh, we don't go for uh, for loops or that kind of thing. There are lots of functions of, of operations that we can use. And basically, the first step in learning how to program is to use a library, to use a vocabulary that is already programmed by other people. So for instance, it's quite easy uh, to uh, identify the first person in this queue as the head of the queue. And this vocabulary exists. The, the, uh, the, the notebook that we are using knows what the head of a sequence is. It knows what the tail of the sequence is. It knows about reversing a sequence. So you see words that represent actions. And that's how it comes about, because now uh, in, we are still in the unplugged mode. So you ask the students to reverse the queue in their, in their book, notepad, and they, and, and they do that by writing the things in reverse direction. But now the, the, the teacher says, well, let us do that mechanically. And so we are going to transform this queue by reversing it. This is the action that reverses the queue and you get the queue reversed. Well, now you could ask the, the same device to reverse the numbers uh, from one to 1,000 or one million, and it will do the same that immediately. So this is the semi-plugged 
step or phase. So the computational model is handled by the teacher. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the plugged mode is going to be very similar. It's just inviting the students now to play the piano, to use the notebook that the, the teacher is using. So uh, this new driving, driving is blending mother language computing. It's quite interesting because that uh, shrinking of the original sentence by removing the definite articles uh, is actually, uh, we, we call it the SMS metaphor. So computers uh, may be, well, now they're starting understanding natural language quite well, as you know, but they, they, they like uh, uh, stereotyped language with as little connective as possible. And uh, so if we use as many connective, this uh, triangle, that means an object subject to a transformation becomes a new object, that is quite effective. And if we um, look at what we are doing, we can shame the transformations. It's very easy for them to see the things changing. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, well, what are we doing here? What is the what is the maths uh, which is underneath underneath this uh, this uh, triangle? Is function composition. So what we are doing is teaching these uh, young kids mm -hmm. functional composition very early. Uh, very. Early. I, I'm surprised that. Functional composition, for at least in in our cur curriculum in Portugal, is uh, is taught in the tenth grade. It's so late. So I I believe we are doing something here because they implicitly, without knowing, they are playing with uh, function composition, the, the 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 shading of transformations from very early. And this is very important because if they use the vocabulary that we give them which are the names of those functions which are already implemented. They learn something which is very, very important. Difficult actions, elaborate actions, are divided into simpler actions. And this is called compositionality, which is the golden word in programming. Programs should be compositional. A very difficult problem task should be divided into simpler tasks. You do this one, you do this the other one, and then the composition of those transformations is going to produce the overall effect. So uh, this teaches a compositional approach, which is very much lacking in computing uh, education at the university level. So it's not uh, it, it, it's lacking at university level. Of course, it's lacking uh, everywhere. Uh, so the link to the so the parallel education of math is obvious, and computing in that trivium thing can actually help. They can prepare the students for concepts that in mathematics is coming are, are coming later, and actually motivating the students for those maths. The plugged mode is, of course, very similar, as I said. Uh, now the students play the piano, as I said, and uh, uh, they get in touch with the uh, uh, other forms of uh, of structuring data. Uh, for instance, pairing. Pairs. When they give hands to each other, they build they build pairs of people. And pairing is the other data structure, very very simple data structure, which is very effective. Uh, the pair is an order, and then you can swap the order, for instance. Uh, and uh, uh, it's the second ingredient in this uh, uh, in this slow path towards data structuring that, uh, of course, later is going to be much more sophisticated. And with sequences and pairs you can do a lot you can actually teach and don't forget that we are a concept we have we're following a concept first uh, approach we can teach a lot of introduce the students to a lot of computer science cartesian coordinates are pairs computer graphics is just playing with cartesian coordinates you know uh, building uh, polygons uh, uh, in this thing uh, in this in, in this context because every point is a pair so a polyline is just a sequence of pairs uh, so computer graphics comes uh, very quickly graphs what are graphs graphs are data structures that for instance um, social networks people are linked uh, to each other so graphs are basically objects linked by arrows automata and so uh, it's it's very little that you ha that they have to manipulate to do a lot, and we are quite happy about this approach because we go very early to uh, to this subliminal or um, implicit teaching of a lot of computing. So their uh, their their education, their their literacy in computing uh, goes quite fast, even if in a very uh, elementary way. But it goes quite fast. Uh, I remember 
uh, the master teachers telling that when the QR code was used, everybody in the in the place was interested. Even even the, the teachers, the other teachers, um, and even the cleaners and all that. Oh, also that that's the way it works. Okay, so uh, their their uh, their literacy in computing and internet starts very early. Uh, now uh, years later, year nine, uh, uh, this uh, idea, this compositional. This compositional approach uh, of uh, this idea of solving a difficult task, task by 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 plugging in com composing uh, 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 actions that are already programmed uh, gets evolves towards something which is the golden the golden principle in programming, which is divide and conquer. And divide and conquer is actually uh, all algorithms are divide and conquer algorithms, even if people tell they are not. Mathematically, they are. So, and this is a problem solving strategy. I think it is, it, it is going to be to be illustrated in the third part. It is a problem solving strategy, which is very intuitive and it is very powerful. I have a big problem to solve. And I'm going to do a transformation of that program into something which is uh, regard it as a as a as a as a better view of that uh, of that problem or a solution of that problem and i divide the problem in sub problems of the same kind and now i rely on some people to help me to transform those uh, those smaller problems they are smaller so they are easier to cope with and once we have the sub solutions the, the partial solutions again there is this compositional view that there is a conquer step that combines those sub solutions to build the the, the solution. And we, I should say, we uh, it's year nine or maybe earlier. I don't know. I, I must say I'm quite surprised uh, by how early we can teach these things. I would have imagined that it should be much later. Uh, I actually have experience of teaching these to later uh, students of grade ten. 11 uh, and I, I'm quite surprised that they can master these things uh, in earlier grades and uh, so it, with very little we we can actually introduce the students to some ah, another very important about divide and conquer it's parallel it's prone to parallelism so it's a parallel way of thinking instead of this loop thing okay start uh, at uh, number one and then start uh, looping okay so uh, 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 it fulfills this idea that who knows it already is programming is already uh, uh, parallel in many senses, but the education in parallel programming is very weak and very, very, very unsatisfying. So uh, I will summarize. Uh, we have tried to to we have this uh, KIST uh, acronym, which is keep it stupidly simple, and I should say sim cheap. This is important. Uh, you can modulate the sophistication of the course. Uh, you can actually be unplugged from beginning to end. Uh, 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 so you no need of computers, mm. but if you have facilities, you have to start plugging a little bit earlier. Uh, so uh, let us keep it simple. The choice of technology is important because this Jupyter notebook is an evolution of the classical notebook that people use in, a, in any standard course. And this link to the natural language has led us to the what is called the functional first paradigm. So teaching, programming, starting from a functional approach, which has other, uh, it has other, other, other uh, uh, um, uh, advantages because that's the language. When they start studying mathematics and physics, functions are every are, are the device that are used to. Um, to 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 cope with those problems. So so problems in in physics or math. So so in a sense, uh, it's the right paradigm because in the course is a aside, they are using this paradigm already. So uh, it quite fi it fits quite well with the instead of the instead of the, the the imperative view being a foreign body is a different thing. Okay. Eventually, of course, we go imperative, but these very early stages for this triangle to work need to be uh, to need to be functional so uh, that's it uh, thank you very much uh, i think i hope to have uh, explained uh, you properly what our approach is and uh, i'm ready to take questions
Thank you. Uh, again, if you have any question, you can either raise your hand and turn on your microphone uh, or you can write them in the chat and we will answer either way. Well, can move on. Well, okay. we will uh, um, do a short break, but we have a question. <laughs> yeah, from, from Martini here. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I would say. Uh, I think it's doable after school activities. Actually, we are not we are no, not doing it in an after school mode, but in a sense we are. In a sense, our teaching is embedded into <laughs> into. So I would say uh, after school activities uh, will work exactly following this model. Yeah, and and. I mean, uh, I if I understand properly, after school in the sense that uh, they have their normally uh, working, uh, and then it's afterwards. It definitely works. It's going to work. Yeah, maybe we could. Yeah. And for instance, the, we usually do workshops, which which I think it's a very good model to do after school activities, for instance, and to. Put some themes around the workshops that we can do in terms of, okay, we'll now play with this and this, and we'll do lots of activities around that. Can be a good model for that. I was thinking that, I don't know, do you hear me? Yeah, yes. I was thinking that your methodology, a huge quality for me is that it's uh, very comprehensive. Yeah. It's uh, for the kids and for the teachers, it's investing quite a lot of hours to learn this kind of competences. It's not easy to learn computational competences. It re requires time and it requires quite an effort. While after school activities mostly or often do have a very important leisure activity component. So it should be fun. And it's yeah. very important to invest in motivation, to motivate the kids to do this work. And I think your uh, methodology and your tools are quite well adapted and prepared to use them in this context to motivate kids. Yeah. yeah. And you don't always, what I was thinking is, is it really necessary to always do the whole year? Or could you split it? Can we split modules. it just you, in, like? You mean modules? I would say modules, modu it could be modular, yeah. It could be more, it depends on what you want to achieve, but it could be modular, provided the same principles are used. I give you an example, and this is interesting concerning adult, adult education. I give a course on music, to the music course, and I use this strategy. The course is called Computing for Musicology. And I, use, I, use, I follow exactly the same path, but now these are adults, okay? They are musicians that, uh, and uh, what's interesting is it works, but it's a bit late. <laughs> it's a bit late in their education. Because it's quite interesting because music is very mathematical, okay? It does, though it doesn't look like. So uh, maths for them is very, very, is very far away. Even though when they're playing an instrument, they are rational number calculator, amazing, parallel and all that. So one of the things that I find is that if we teach them this, these things early, as early as possible, uh, there uh, uh, it will be more effective. So, uh, uh, so it takes a while before they gear themselves again into this way of thinking. Those music students, of course. So, but it, modular can be modular. It depends on uh, uh, it depends on what we want to achieve. You, again, it's backwards teaching. You have to tell. Well, I want to teach this. What, what, so what is the starting point? And also taking into account their background. What, I, and what I've and uh, what i realized is that for this kind of uh, path, a background in programming is, in standard programming, is not good, is not effective. I give uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, stra uh, teaching strategy to kids from the 10th, 11th grade. Some of them already know how to program. And it's quite interesting because I I I, I asked I, in the beginning I asked, do you know about programming? Have you programmed? And more and more people have programmed. And then in the end of this, I ask, uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, 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 so how, how does this match to what you 
uh, what you knew before. And some of them say, forget about what I knew, I knew before. OK, forget about that. No, the, the, uh, uh, I feel I have to start from scratch. So in a sense, we are perhaps doing something which is uh, uh, essential knowledge, okay? Rather than rather than start playing the piano without the knowing how to read music, something like this, okay? Some knowledge like this, but uh, it can be modular. So it can be modular and program. Uh, we, we have not done that. Maybe we are going to be challenged, Luis and the Ines, in the schools to do that. For instance, a particular school that doesn't want to to teach them to, to teach this every week, but for instance, a particular module, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope to be under, to understand. If, uh, please tell if I am understanding what your modular uh, your after school activities are. So uh, it's af after the normal day, okay? Yeah. yeah, it's usually afternoons, starting from five, six, uh, and it's activities very diverse activities. There might be an offer about sports activities, there might be soccer or football or whatever. And then there are also um, activities around robotics, educational robotics and computing uh, to start playing or learning about Makey Makey or Microbit or some kind of uh, electronic tools you can program with. Yes, for instance, uh, we have a library for computer graphics, which is very, and uh, and and with that you can do a lot. Okay, we could show videos. Your, uh, uh, um, you can do a lot. Uh, uh, and they, they, well, they were less excited that I, at least in our previous year, they were less excited about computer graphics than I uh, had anticipated. I know uh, Ines can tell, but that this, those are the things that they are visible. You start things. OK, throwing objects, you we have examples of using this library to simulate the Apollo 13 <laughs> movement, OK, movements uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, according to Newton's law. So it depends. The degree of sophistication can be as uh, but it's quite flexible because these very this uh, little kernel that we have this sequence processing the pairing thing and then the, the graphical library, it's quite effective. So it's a, it's a good kernel, OK? It's a good kernel. And so yeah, and in, the they, second, in the second part of uh, this um, webinar, we will show some concrete examples that we do in workshops yeah, and, uh, and all of that. So maybe uh, it will pass some idea of what. And with respect to fun, for instance, the workshops that we do, uh, are completely unplugged. Okay, and uh, and yes, the reality is that they they enjoy a lot the, the kind of workshops we do, and without computers, okay. only pen and pen and paper. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. So uh, we will not take a fifteen minute break. Good. So see you uh, in, in some minutes. minutes. Yes, yes. Interesting okay. minutes, good, part, good. Part two. And thank, thank you, Susan. No, no, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll restart. Yeah, let's start. Right. The, sec the third part of this first part so in the morning. So we will share my. Can I just confirm that everything is appearing? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but. I'm sorry. OK, OK, everything seems to be working. So in this third part, we'll actually look at some uh, sort of ends on activities. These activities um, are some of uh, the stuff we do when we give uh, workshops at schools and things like that. Uh, and uh, we will uh, basically start by solving a mystery while learning computer science. And what's the mystery? I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news, but someone kidnapped Cristiano Ronaldo in Saudi Arabia. OK, uh, and uh, we need to figure out um, who was guilty. OK, and I'm going to show you a picture that has several people and um, we need to find out who kidnapped Cristiano Ronaldo. And I will give you some clues that have to do with computing knowledge. Okay, 
So let's see if you're able to solve the mystery. All right, so this is the place where the guilty person is. We know that she was having dinner at some fancy restaurant. OK, um, and um, this picture also has some clues uh, regarding like uh, who, who committed the crime. OK, um, so I don't know if somebody wants to comment what objects might constitute clues or something. If not, I will just spoil it for you. Um, but I can give you a small hint. Um, our first clue has to do with binary representation of information. So as um, you probably know, um, a computer um, only knows what's a zero and what's a one. Uh, and the zero or a one are just two things. Um, so binary representation of information means that we are going to represent information using only two things. Uh, in the case of computers, typically zeros and ones. And why? Because basically a computer consists of a bunch of transistors uh, that are like switches that can be on or off. And we associate uh, on to one and off to zero, OK? So let's say a computer only understands zeros and ones, um, meaning that everything that you see on a computer, like any text, any picture, uh, any music, any video, it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. And it's quite amazing the power that just two, two things have. Um, so in this picture, can you identify something that can be associated with zeros and ones? So I'm probably just talking to myself, so I will answer myself too. Uh, yes, uh, I can identify something that can be associated with zeros and ones. So we can associate it a lamp that is off uh, to a zero, and we can associate a lamp that is on to a one. OK, so now when we look again at the sequence of lamps on the street, we'll get a binary code. And although we can only see the first eight lamps on the street, um, such that the, the first four are turned on and the other four are turned off, uh, actually, there were 64 lamps on that street. OK, so we get a binary code with 64 bits. A bit it's, is a zero or, or a one. OK, so if we look at the sequence of the lamps and um, we do this correspondence between on one and off zero, we get a binary code with 64 bits. But what does this mean? Like, this is a clue, but how is this a clue? Well, surprisingly, this sequence hides an image with an X clue, OK? And how? Well, to understand this, we need to understand the representation of images by bitmaps. And Professor Zenuno already talked a bit about this. So, uh, to simplify, we are only going to consider pictures that only have uh, two colors, say black and white or blue and white. Um, and on a computer, um, an image can be represented by a matrix of, of zeros and ones. And each small square is, is a bit because it's a zero or a one, uh, which can also be called a pixel. And these rectangles of zeros and ones are called bitmaps. Now, how do we go from a binary code, this binary code here, to a picture? Well, we need a grid. We need a grid to put the numbers on and to sort of uh, pass the binary code, okay, the sequence, to the picture. And we start writing the bits. Uh, as if they were, um, as if we were writing a text. So we start up 
and then we go from left to right, and then we go to the line uh, below, so on and so forth, okay? So um, let's see if you understood what I said by uh, solving this activity. So we are going to launch a poll uh, and you should select uh, what image is represented by the bitmap on the left. Yeah, now, you should now see the, the poll in front of you everyone that is remotely connected uh, to yeah okay. uh, but you may have sorry let me just show um let uh, me you, just... you will see the image in the center of your screen but you can also uh, click on the on the right on the upper uh, on the top right i want you to, to show... close it yeah, so let me just show you. Um, so you see the, the poll appears here, here in the center and it kind of covers and it kind of covers the image. So you should close this. OK, you should close this and then go here. Click on polls. And they will and it will appear on the right. And when I share the presentation again, you will be able to see the presentation here and the the poll on the right so you can see both things at the same time i will now share the presentation again okay so how many people? so uh, so now you should should choose a b and or c Okay, so we have one response. Two. Two responses that are correct. Okay, very good, very well. Congratulations. And um, so basically, um, what what we did was we filled an eight by eight width with a binary sequence with the street lamps. Okay, so we sort of put these bits in the grid on the right okay and we colored the ones black and we colored the zeros white and we got a black and white pictures picture with little squares like this so the correct answer was c yeah okay so the correct answer was c um yeah yeah i know this is tricky because if you miss a bit then it will show something else um now this is our next clue okay this is our next clue and it consists of two letters can you understand what letters are being represented So the first letter here is a Q. Q and this one looks like an A, <laughs> but it's not an A. It's an error. No, okay, no. it has that little leg, okay, that little foot on the bottom right. So it's an R. It's the first one is Q and the other one is R. Correct. Um, okay, so it's QR. Now, QR, what, what, what does that mean, QR? QR. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. exactly. Uh, so, we are going to analyze the QR code on the restaurant menu, okay? So, we need to figure out what it uh what it encodes but we can't use our phones and point at it and it will give us the answer because this is a special qr code it's a little simpler than uh, the real qr codes we call them we call it an enciclo qr okay and uh, we will learn um how to uh, how to decipher it 
uh, using only our brain, not our phone. So how does this in CQQR uh, work? Well, first you can see that uh, the QR code has three eyes. OK, so uh, we have one eye on the top left, then we have okay. one eye on top right, and then we have another eye on bottom left. So these are like the three eyes of the code and they basically uh, tell you the size of the QR code. So when you're pointing your device, it knows where it begins, where it ends, and it can also figure out the orientation. OK, because if you try to read a QR code and it's like upside down or something, it will still work because it has these eyes as reference. You can also see these gray areas but we won't care about them because they have sort of special information reserved for the reader. What we will care about is this part here, um, this yellow part, okay? And um, our NCQR QR code is divided into 13 zones and each <laughs> zone consists of four black or white squares, okay? So, and each square will represent something. In addition, um, we will associate each black square with the bit one and each white square to the bit zero. So we can sort of transform our QR code um, to zeros and ones, okay? If it was black, we write a one. If it was white, we write a zero. And this way we can also associate each, um, each zone to a binary code, okay? We can assign a binary code to each zone. And how do we do that? First, if we have a square zone, we will uh, read the code as if it were a text, okay? The order is here one two three four so in this case it would be zero zero one zero all right the other possibilities are if we have a zone that has that is a vertical rectangle in which case we read from top to bottom so the the binary code associated to zone 12 would be zero zero one zero uh, and if we have an horizontal rectangle, we read it from left to right. So the binary code associated to zone seven would be one, one, zero, zero. Let's see if you understood this. We will now ask you to identify binary codes of some zones. Uh, so we will launch uh, the poll. And please pay attention that you actually have three questions, okay? So it says um, at the yeah, bottom, the you have yeah. like one of three, two of three, and three of three. So we ac you actually have three questions on this, on this poll. And don't forget to open the poll on the right because you will need to see the yes. image that I am sharing to locate the, the zones. Yeah, the first one is asking you about zone four. Okay. So you should select the binary code corresponding to zone four. Then you should select the binary code corresponding to zone nine. And finally, the binary code corresponding to zone 10. OK. All right, so we have again four answers and they're all correct. OK, great class. Um, so let's move on. Um, if we actually have had the patience to write the binary codes of all the 13 zones, and our students have to do that, um, we would get uh, so 13 binary codes. But what is the meaning of these binary codes, you ask? And I tell you, 
Well, each binary code will encode a letter of the alphabet. So we will associate binary codes with letters. And how are you going to do that? Well, we could do it in a sort of random way. Uh, you know, OK, so I'm going to say that 1110 is A and 0010 is B and so on and so forth. I could do that, but it would be chaos. OK, so we need sort of a structured way to to assign binary codes to letters. And so we are going to talk about binary trees, which um, we actually have already talked about uh, and binary encodings. So it would be very easy if the alphabet had only two letters, say A and B, because we could say, OK, A is zero, B, B is one, done. But the alphabet has more letters, OK? So we need to <laughs> uh, to have more branches in our in our binary tree. Uh, two branches are not enough. And so we are going to build a bigger binary tree. This time we are going to divide each branch, each of the previous branches into two other branches. And whenever you have a branch to the left, you write a zero. When you have a branch to the right, you write a one. Uh, and so now in this case, if we follow the path from the top to the letter, we we get uh, binary codes with two bits for each letter. So the binary code of A would be uh, 0, 0, for B it would be 0, 1, for C it would be 1, 0, and for D it would be 1, 1. So we went from two letters to four letters. And if you do this again, and we sort of open, uh, divide each branch in two again, we are going to double the number of letters, and we are going to have eight letters. OK, eight letters. And um, so now, for instance, the binary code of letter A would be 000. The binary code of letter D would be uh, 011 of letter F would be 101 and so on. You just follow the path starting from the root on the top on the top to the to the letter on the bottom. OK. Uh, however, uh, we need more bits. So in each zone of our QR code has four bits. So we are going to be able to represent 16 letters if we add another level to our tree. OK. So now we have a bigger tree, a bigger binary tree. Uh, and it's called a binary tree because each branch um, divides in, is divided into at most two other branches. Um, and we will uh, launch a poll and we will ask you to identify some binary codes, four bit binary codes. OK, so again, you have uh, three questions. The first one is asking you to select the binary code associated with letter F, a. a, letter A, and then you have letter F. Yes. And then you have letter P. So A, F, and P. Please select the four bit binary codes. Two responses, correct. Let's see if we can get three responses. OK, can we get one more? Five responses, amazing. And they're all correct. Very well, six responses. Oh my God, we are getting famous. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to reveal the answers, but everybody got it right very well. Eight responses. <laughs> OK, I'll stop. Yeah, yeah, it's so the, the, the four bit binary code of letter A is 0000, letter F is 0101, and letter P is 1111. And we could do this for all 16 letters, uh, and we would get these binary codes. OK, but note that we can only reach letter P. We cannot reach letter Z. Um, and why? Because, you know, 
if we only have a tree with four levels, we can only represent two times two times two times two, which is 16 letters. So how many bits would we need to represent um, each of the 26 letters in the alphabet? We would, we would need one more bit because with five bits, we could represent two to the five or two times two times two times two times two, which is 32 things and 32 is greater than 26. So if we wanted to represent every letter in the alphabet, we would need five bits, not four. But we only have room for four in our little baby QR code. So, you know, you have to deal with it. And we are finally ready to decipher the QR code that appears on the restaurant menu and cons consequently find out Ukinep Cristiano Ronaldo, because we can sort of look at the 13 binary codes and write the letters corresponding to each binary code. And we are going to get a message. OK. And uh, if we do that, OK, if we write the letters um, corresponding. So, yeah, we, we're going to to ask you to do that. So you should look at the binary tree and um, and the binary codes that appears associated with each zone, and then write letters that yeah you you, you need to type you need to type so it, it's not a multiple choice question you need to to actually type all the letters all the thirteen letters yes. as soon as you have the sequence of letters that corresponds to zones. 1, 2, 13, then you should write those letters in sequence in the text box and then submit your answer. Yeah, so 13 capital letters. First one is a B. I'll give you some more time because I know this takes some time. It does take some time. <laughs> but yeah, once we have um, once we have a correct answer, we will review it. Okay, 30 seconds. Think quickly. Type quickly. You can do this. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year. OK, so we have three responses and they're all correct, I think. Yeah. So um, it, the, the 13 letters actually correspond to a, a, a sentence with three words. So if we introduce spaces, we get beef con alfas, which is in Portuguese, okay? So you need to go to Google Translator and translate it to a language you understand, namely Spanish or English, okay? I have no idea how to say this in Spanish. No. What does it mean in English? Is stick with the... Leches. Exactly, yeah. It appears in the Le next lech one. Lechuga, right? lechuga. Lechuga is, is alfa. 
it's a maybe steak steak with, with um let's just yes, yes. Salad. Yeah. Salad. yeah steak with steak, steak with salad, salad. How do you say it? How do you say it in Spanish? Entre con ensalada. Entre con ensalada. Yeah. Because if you look nice, yeah. <laughs> beef, 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 Yes. Ah, and for us, we inter intercosto it's with the ribbon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so because now you will see the image and you will find we who can. Yeah, out. so so if the last two is steak with lettuce. Who kidnapped Ronaldo? <laughs> it's Georgina. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's Georgina, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the wife yeah. of the wife wife the, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> there is there is another I was thinking of because you said Georgina does a film yeah. which is called Telecapesse. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. And there's also a Georgina. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> a guy who's got killed who gets killed during Yeah, 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 I know, I know. I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> no no, but this is Cristiano Ronaldo's wife, okay? <laughs> That's why we are playing with this name. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're kidding. We don't know who this is. We just know that uh, this person was eating steak with lettuce <laughs> or salad. Uh, okay, so Mr. Saul, congratulations. Now we are going to talk a bit about digital communication and cryptography. Okay, so first we talked about kidnapping and now we're going to talk about hackers because we like dark stuff. So, um, secure communication is actually a hot topic nowadays. And it's something that, you know, privacy and security in electronic communications is like super important because who guarantees that a hacker isn't spying this webinar or reading the messages that we send um, by WhatsApp and all of that, you know? So we need to have mechanisms to, um, to allow us to feel safe when we communicate using digital means. And that's what cryptography is all about. If you open WhatsApp and you go to the security info, um, it tells you that your messages um, and calls are, are secured with end-to-end -end encryption. But what does this mean? What does encryption mean? Well, we need to talk a bit about this um, the crypto cryptography. So cryptography is precisely um, the study of the techniques used for secure communication. So ways to ensure that only the person who sends and only the person who receives the message can read what is written there. So we need to sort of jumble the message and make it very weird um, in order for a hacker or something not be able to read it. And uh, in cryptography, there are two main um, techniques that we must use. First one is encryption. So encryption is the process of hiding a message using a code or a cipher. And if you look to the image on the right, you can see that the cipher used here is to move each letter one position forward. For instance, letter A will move to letter B, letter B will move to letter C and so on until letter Z goes to letter A again. So if you are writing a message uh, and you want to encrypt it with a cipher, instead of writing an A, you would write a B, instead of writing a B, you would write a C, and so on. And what is decryption? Well, decryption is precisely the opposite process. 
It's when you have a message that's completely, you know, you, you don't understand what's, what's the meaning because it has been encrypted and you want to recover the original message. You want to recover the original information. So if the cipher we used to encrypt the message was move each letter one position forward, then the cipher we used to decrypt the message will be move each letter one position backwards. So if you have a B, you will say, oh, it was an A. And if you see a C, you will say, oh, this was supposed to be a B and so on. OK, this type of uh, ciphers um, are very popular and they were uh, they were developed by uh, Caesar, okay, a uh, Roman general. Oh, I don't know. Sorry, sorry. I was just trying to close it. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, um, it's, so the cipher user is an example of a Caesar cipher, which consists of shifting each letter of the alphabet a certain number of positions. And as I was saying, it was uh, created by uh, Julius Caesar, a general who commanded Rome uh, between 49 before Christ and 44 before Christ. Uh, and basically, he wanted to send information to his soldiers, but he didn't want the enemy to retrieve that information. So he, he had to hide the information. For instance, say he wanted to send the message to his soldier, which is attack today. But Caesar doesn't want the enemy to know they are going to be attacked today. So you need to, so we want you to apply the cipher, move each letter one position forward. You, you need to, you need to share again, sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't share it again. It's not my okay. fault. No, it was my fault. Because yeah. it started, it started messing with my computer. Yeah, 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 my fault. Can you see yeah, it it's now? Okay. okay. Wait. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's everything. Everything is okay, right? Yeah. yeah? OK, so now um, you should apply the cipher move each letter one position forward to the message attack today. What do you get? So we are going to launch a poll. So basically, you just need to move each letter one position. If it's A, it's going to be B. If it's T, it's going to be something else. I'm not going to tell you the answer. Think for yourself, OK? And let's see how we are doing. Okay. Oh, we are, we were evil because we you need to go to the okay. last letter. Yeah, the last letter. I mean, not that evil because you just need to. Yeah, if you, you start. You actually just need to. <laughs> to start it from the end. Yeah. <laughs> no more hints. No more hints. Yeah, no more hints. <laughs> Okay, we have one response. We'll just wait a few more minutes. Okay, another response. Very good. Uh -huh. Right. Correct. Okay. So, uh, the correct answer was answer um, option B because uh, letter the last letter which is uh, Y. Oops. So the the letter letter Y Y is gonna uh, be transformed into Z. So it will end in Z. So um, the encrypted message was this thing here, and you can see this is a very weird word. So if I sent you a text with this word, you would probably think that there was a cat walking over my keyboard. 
because it has no meaning. And that's the point of cryptography. You have something with meaning and then you do stuff to sort of hide its meaning, okay? Um, now we are going to show you a different cipher. And to just to make things very clear, uh, nowadays we use much more sophisticated encryption techniques. Okay, this is a very simple cipher. So our computers actually use more more complex ciphers, of course. Uh, now, consider another cipher which consists of exchanging A with Z, B with Y, C with X, and so on. So basically the first letter of the alphabet switches with the last letter and the second letter of the alphabet gets swapped with the second last letter of the alphabet and so on and so forth okay so what word is x l n k f g r m t hiding now we will launch a poll for you to answer please So you have uh, two questions in the poll. The first one uh, is asking you to, to identify the original word. And the second one is asking you uh, if there is any letter that remains in the same position and uh, and why. I mean, not it's not, right. not asking you the why <laughs> part. I am, but I also have the right to ask you questions. So my question is C. So you have A, B, and my question C. So let's see how you're doing. Why can't I see? Okay. Okay, so we have three responses, five responses, and they're all correct. Perfect. Perfect, yeah, very well. Um, so, you know, we have this X, L, N, blah, blah, blah. And if we switch the letters, we will get like X, C, L, D, N, M, K, P, etc. So the even message is computing. And the answer to the second um, question is no, because the alphabet has an even number of letters. And if we have an even number of things, there is no middle thing. So, you know, we have five fingers and we have a middle finger because five is an odd number. But if I had four fingers only, there, there, there would be no middle finger. So there is no middle letter and consequently um, no letter uh, is stays the same. Every letter is mapped to a different letter. OK, now we have a more difficult question for you because we are very evil. And um, what happened? Well, someone encrypted a message by applying first the Caesar cipher and then the AZ cipher. So the AZ cipher is like you switch A with Z and so on. And the person got this message in the end. What was the original message then? So if we apply the composition of these two ciphers, it's like we are composing two functions. So function composition, again, is very important. It's like A is sent to Y because uh, if you apply the Caesar cipher, A will go to B. And then if you apply the AZ cipher, B will go to Y. So if you apply both ciphers one after another to letter A, you will get letter Y. And if you apply both to letter B, you will get letter X. And if you apply both to C, you will get W and so on. And uh, we are going to launch a poll yeah. for you to tell us what... This is the last one. Yeah, this is the last poll. And so you just need to find out what is the original message after applying these two ciphers. 
Uh, this question is trickier and uh, it would be very convenient if you, you know, write the whole alphabet on paper and uh, actually write all letters. Um, <laughs> it would be way easier. And yes, when we do this with our students, they actually do that. Um, yeah, but we, we, but we put the alphabet in front yeah, of them. Yeah, we put the alphabet in front of them and it's, it's way easier. Um, but let's see if someone figures it out. Yeah, 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 just a little bit. You only need to figure out what the third letter is and what the last letter is. OK, so we already have the correct answer. Very good. The answer is mathematics. OK, so and how should you think about this? Consider the following. Um, when we put our shoes on, we first put our sock and then we put our shoe. OK, so it's like the sock is Caesar cipher and the shoe is the AZ cipher. But if we want to take our shoe off and get undressed, you first take the shoe and then you take the sock. So here you so you need to undo the thing you you undo first the thing that you did last. So if we applied uh, in last place the AZ cipher, it means that when we want to decrypt the message, we need to decipher AZ first, and then we need to decipher Caesar. So we first undo AZ, and then we undo Caesar, right? Because if I do action one and I do action two, and I need to undo this, I undo first action two, and then I undo action one. I think this is more or less intu intuitive. And uh, yeah, so the answer was mathematics for you to, Remember that mathematics is very, very important to computing and uh, to um, make possible for us to use our machines, computers to do uh, all the amazing things that, you know, they can do. And this is the end. I know you're very sad because you wanted to spend the whole uh, <laughs> year, the whole week, week uh, hearing us. But don't be sad because we will return in the afternoon and in the <laughs> afternoon you are actually going to write computer programs. It's going to be uh, exactly ants on. So you're going to write computer programs. And now um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free and don't be shy to ask them. I will stop. Oh, I already stopped sharing my screen, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, so yeah, you can use the chat or raise your hand and we will enable your your microphone. And that's today for this morning, at least. Yeah, and then we have the afternoon session starting at uh, 30 past 2 or 2 yeah. 30 if you prefer Spanish time. Thank you, Enric. Or Enric. 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 Enric, I guess. Enric. Gracias. Gracias. Enric. Enric yeah. That's, that's more like this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think he oh. yeah, okay. So no questions?
explaining. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if there is no questions. Uh, then we'll close. Yeah, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, listening to us. And uh, we hope to see you in the afternoon session where we will actually program. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And Professor Zanio, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. For being with us today. Yeah, because in <laughs> Portugal, in Portugal, it, it, it's a national holiday. So nobody works, but <laughs> Professor Zenun is working with us. With and us. All the, and the Spanish people. <laughs> and all Spanish so people. What's, what's uh, what at, at what time in the afternoon? Uh, so it's 2.30 here, meaning 1.30 1 1 there. there okay. Yeah, okay. you need to travel in time. <laughs> Time for <laughs> Okay. So. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank See you, you soon. See you yeah. Bye. See you bye. Soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.